Dean and I met, uh, I was at the Belmont Plaza Glass Hat, appearing in the Glass Hat. <clears throat> it's so funny. Frank Sinatra's mother adored me. She loved what I did in my act and adored me. And she just told me every night. She was there four nights a week, having dinner in the Glass Hat and watching my show. Uh, she said, I'm going to bring my son in. He's going to love you. I don't know who his son is. And Frank hadn't really hit yet. I'm talking about 43, 42, I think. Uh, yeah, I was 16 at the Glass Hat. And I meet Dean, who was on WMCA sustaining 15 minutes every day, five days a week. And he was staying at the Belmont Plaza because the station owned the hotel, or the hotel owned the station, and he was able to stay there for nothing. He wasn't paid, so therefore, they were, got to get him on accommodation where he didn't have to pay, and he was doing fine. And I met him in the coffee shop of the Belmont Plaza Hotel one day, and I was sitting at the counter having a very loose egg salad sandwich, and I bite the sandwich, and most of the egg salad is now on my shirt and tie. And I look around, and there's this handsome guy sitting there, <laughs> hysterical. And I laughed, because he laughed, and I looked down, he said, lick it. So I lifted the tie, I licked it, what else do you want? How you fix for spit? And we met that way. And I knew the moment I looked at him that I found that big brother, I found a friend, I found someone that, that read me, apparently. And I was in need of someone in my life. I was alone pretty much at the time. My folks were still on the road. Uh, I, hadn't, I wasn't married yet, so for two years, Dean and I are running into one another because they picked up my contract at the, at the Glass Hat I went in for two weeks and stayed 66. Oh, and I was able to put my money away. And I was making a lot of money there. hundred and a half a week, net, with a room. And I was in heaven. And we, we got to know one another pretty well. And we got into discussions about show business. And he was talking about having his nose fixed. And I tried to talk him out of it. I said, you're a handsome man. You look a little like Danny Thomas, but you're a handsome man. And he really had a, he, he had a very nice beak. He could have been an eagle, okay, <laughs> with this beak. And I'm trying to talk him out of it. And he says, I know what you're getting at. You don't want me for competition because you're a good looking kid. I said, but you're a nice looking man. He said, I'm an eagle and we'll fix it. He had the nose job done. Well, for the next three or four months, I had the most fun with him. He's got, they, they did what you do with the nose job. Remember, we're talking about a lot of years ago when it was still not that technically perfect. So he had a shoe to protect the surgery, which came down to the lip. Now, when you're carrying this piece of plastic that's up and you got the lip, I mean, it's funny. It's just hysterical. I said, you're not singing with this. He said, no, no, I had to take uh, two weeks off. Now he's eating and having to lift this to get the lip to bite. Well, when he lifted this to put a piece of tuna salad in his lip, and then when he would drop it, the chewing would make it dance. Well, you know, there's no sitting there with a straight face. And I said, are you sure you know what you did? Did they leave holes for breathing? And I went through this for two or three weeks. His nose <laughs> gets better. And uh, he goes back to sustaining. And sure enough, in that interim, Sinatra opened at what was the Rio Bamba. He got sick, and they called Dean to replace him. Well, it was a great break for Dean. And he went in to the Rio, the Rio Bamba, substituted for Frank. But nothing happened. So Dean uh, plays the Rio Bamba. I don't remember if it was two nights or three nights. Frank was out with a really bad strep throat. And he did terrific, but nothing happened from that. And I was so disappointed. I was there. He did great. He really was terrific.
But you know, when people buy a ticket to see Frank Sinatra and he's not there, they tend to be a little less appreciative. And when I say he did great, he, he maintained his, I'd have been a nervous wreck. And when Dean was nervous, you would never be, you were never able to tell. Uh, and I was really disappointed nothing came from it. And then he was back on radio. And now it's been a year and, oh, I don't know, a year and 10 months that we've been friendly. And one night I went to Leon and Eddie's for the celebrity. They had celebrity night, Leon and Eddie's, where everyone in New York was there. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know if I ever told you this, Sam, but it was an incredible, it was like in a movie. Uh, they announced my name at Leon and Eddie's. What? And there was four people clapping. They heard my name, you know. It's the worst sound in show business when you just hear three or four. The last thing I heard was a cricket, like. <laughs> I don't know what to do. So I, I get up and I take a bow and Sonny King is emceeing Leon and I, Come on, let's get him up, folks. Let's hear it. And then you heard five more. Well, I didn't, I was dumbfounded. So I get up and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I don't talk because I do a record act and I don't know why they asked for, for me to come here unless they thought I had my records. I don't have them. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. And uh, it's nice, everyone is glad. And I ran out of air and words, and Dean jumps up on the stage. Hey, I saw you at the Belmont Plaza the other night. You were terrific. I was, yeah, and we're working together. The audience thinks it was a setup. And we did 10 minutes, and it was incredible. And it was all about where do you get your records from? I said, from the store. What store? I don't know, but, and who carries your needles? And whatever, the, I have no idea what we did. It was terrific. They asked us to come back the next Sunday. Then I go to Atlantic City. I don't see Dean now for, uh, he went to the Rio, Rio Cabana in Chicago with Buddy Lester. I go to Atlantic City, the 500 Club, and a singer called Jack Randall had a strep throat, couldn't go on, and uh, Skinny D'Amato comes back to me and says, we got to get another act, you know, uh, you got any suggestions? I said, no, I don't know. Uh, you want another singer? He said, no, no, not another singer. I said, but wait a minute, I know a singer that's not only a singer, but I also do shtick with him. So you could get, you'll be getting two things, the singer and the guy that I'll do more than just a record act. I didn't know what I was talking about. Dean Martin. Dean had just come back from Chicago, was in New York doing nothing, and they called him. He came to Atlantic City. The first night he goes out and does three songs. The orchestra was six pieces, fife and drum. I mean, we're talking about a small little place. Sat 200 people, the 500 Club. And Dean and I are doing this first show. He does his three songs, I do my three records, and we're off the stage. Skinny comes backstage and says, where's the funny stuff that you were gonna do with him? I said, well, you know, we have to warm up. Warm up, huh? If in the next show, which is on in an hour, you don't do something together, you both have cement shoes. I'm eating a pastrami sandwich, and I tore the bag in half, and I used a pencil that was laying on the, because the dresser was a nail, so you can see what we had there. And I'm writing on this pastrami bag, thoughts, thinking back to my dad, what could we do in the next show? And the stains of the pastrami are on the bag. The bag is in my safe at my bank at home, still got that bag with the rundown of things that I'm thinking and I'm now gonna sit with him and tell him what I'm thinking. And I did, and we went out in the second show and did two hours and 40 minutes. 
I had the bag on the piano, so I'd remember what next shtick was that I told him about. Now, I have to say this about Dean, and I've said it all of my life. He had a brain like a univac. He would soak up what you're telling him, and he, he was incapable of forgetting it. I said to him, uh, if you just sing, gee, but I'd love to see that old gang of mine, my old gang of mine, I'll put on a busboy's jacket, I'll come out with my hair. My hair was like up to here. I looked like uh, uh, Ann Miller. I had such a head of hair. And it was terrible about Ann Miller. Did you hear that? She fell down and broke her hair. Wait. So I'm, I've got this hair, right? And I put it in my face and part it with grease and I've got the, the napkin, and Dean is singing that old gang of mine, and I'm doing goodbye forever, and I start to cry. And that turned into a marvelous bit. But Dean was impeccable. His natural sense of time was like nothing I'd ever seen in my life. He almost knew where I was going when I started. He almost knew when to pull back and when to go get me. In that first night, I was feeling that. Which, of course, for the next 10 years, I found I was working with this genius. And for 10 years, I watched this man do magic. His, his innate sense of comedy was so... Give me an example. The first week we were in Atlantic City, I know that he's marvelous, and I know that, Jesus Christ, if I can just give him the material to bring out all of that stuff, it would be sensational. We go to have a cup of coffee after a show one night, and he orders pumpkin pie. Now picture the pumpkin pie, the wedge of pumpkin pie. <sighs> I'm watching him. He takes the fork and puts it, cuts it like you do the edge of the pie but he leaves the little piece there and sticks his fork in the largest part of the pie and sticks it up to his nose and it's licking what's now dripping all over his face. And I thought I would have a hemorrhage from laughing. It was the most brilliant, most marvelous physical, he, because he, he put his napkin on his lap. He took the fork and he's building and getting my attention cuts that little piece, as most people would take, in their mouth. And when he stuck the fork in the large part and moved this way, I said, well, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I got lightning in a bottle here. It, and, and remember, my mind, I know we've got to build on what we're doing because the lines around the 500 Club are now hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of people who have heard word to mouth about these two crazy kids that did two hours and 20 minutes the first night. And now you can't get in there. Now there's cops and there's police officers on horses. That's what happened within seven days. I don't think we have what is commensurate with that. I think what we have is, is a little lightning in the bottle, but I was a stickler on getting things nailed and locked in place because I knew from my dad that if you did that, you could break out and always come back to what you have locked in place. So I was writing every night, every single night, and then I'd have to catch him coming off the golf course, and that would be like four in the afternoon, and I'm sitting in my car waiting for him at the country club to drive him home and tell him this shtick I just wrote. We did it that night and did it the next show. And that night I'd write, and we would put it in the next night. By the time we finished at the 500 Club, we had seven hours of material. And all in order. But we broke away from it. And it was, I mean, we were getting, he was getting 100 and a half a week, I was getting 175. Because I did comedy, so I got $25 more. In less than six months, we were getting 6,000 a week. In the first year, we were up to 20,000 at the Capitol Theater and 30,000 at the Copa. So it happened very, very quickly. But I had never, ever seen 
what looked like this quiet, laid-back man put that brain into first gear on the stage. 